Awesome. All right. So uh, just a brief introduction about myself. My name is Peter. I am a uh, student at Seneca College in my second year in the Information and Security degree. And I'll be giving my talk called Application Fingerprinting with Kitsune. Let me just get a quick survey here. How many of you have heard of the OPM data breach? Sorry. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's rated one of the largest data breaches this year. There were actually two incidents, one in May and one in June, and there were over 22.1 million records stolen. But it's not the only data breach that happened. There have been multiple data breaches this year, ranging from uh, in the healthcare in incidents in the healthcare industry, military, um, government, etc. <clears throat> So the, the question is, is this unique to this year only? And reports actually show that it's not. The cost of data breaches has been increasing year by year, and there's, there has been a 23% increase over the last two years. And the average cost uh, for a data breach that happens is $3.7 million, which is big right now. Um, in 2000. In 2014 alone, there were 472 breaches and 140 million records stolen. This was uh, taken from the Verizon report, which was published this year, and it spans multiple countries, so it's not just USA alone. It's USA, Europe, Canada, South America, et cetera. Um, for, furthermore, a lot of the breaches that happened were due to vulnerabilities, and the one of the things that the reports showed was that uh, the vulnerabilities which were um, exploited, there was a patch for them over a year old. So 99% of the exploited vulnerabilities, there was already a patch released. Uh, so you know, there would be an exploit, then uh, there would be a CVE published, and then a year after that CVE published, uh, they found out that some of the systems were st still exploitable to that vulnerability. So evidently, vulnerability patching is a huge problem. The question is, why? What makes it so difficult to identify what applications are running on a system and fix those vulnerabilities if they show up? And it really comes down to one main aspect. That IT departments don't know what, what applications are running on their systems. So for instance, Take Seneca College, for example. Every student has their own uh, account where they can publish their own web applications, which they develop. Um, but a lot of them are not completely security focused, so when they publish a web application, it may be vulnerable. Furthermore, when the student leaves, their account may not be completely deactivated, so the vulnerabilities can still be there. And it's hard for Seneca College um, or these big IT companies to scan everything and figure out what the vulnerable software is. And there's a few main reasons for this. Um, so infrastructure is becoming increasingly more complex as we're moving from uh, hardware systems to more like cloud computing software, Docker containers, uh, virtual machines, et cetera. So for instance, uh, we don't only have to think about the vulnerabilities which are in the uh, containers, but also the containers themselves. For instance, the recent Venom vulnerability, where a piece of malware could break out of the virtual machine and infect the host. So we also have to uh, take that into account and plan for that. Um, furthermore, uh, there are a lot of cloud computing services where you can just take your application and publish it um, or deploy your application. But it's impossible for the cloud uh, hosting providers to identify what applications you're running and prevent these vulnerabilities. So these third party, um, also a lot of these applications use third party services, libraries such as you know, Ruby on Rails or Django, or uh, a website may be using WordPress or Joomla, which they all have vulnerabilities. So you, not only do you have to account for the application that's vulnerable, but any libraries that the application uses that could be vulnerable as well. Um, and a as you develop your career um, as a software developer, you can s you oftentimes change companies sometimes, and you may not have a full picture of uh, the software that's running on the system. 
So how can, how can we fix this issue? How can we find out what vulnerable software is on the system um, and clearly identify what they are? There is a process for this. It's called application fingerprinting, which is, tries to identify what applications uh, and what libraries are on the system. So uh, let's examine some of the current tools that are out there. The first, it's called uh, P0F, which tries to uh, find these applications based on network activity. But it's a purely uh, offensive tool. So as a, uh, from a purely defensive standpoint, uh, you might want to prevent P0F from finding your application. And the same thing with Blind Elephant. It's a great tool uh, which tries to identify these applications based on the source code which, is, which it produces, uh, the HTML source code. But again, uh, it's an attacking uh, tool, not a defensive tool. So as a defender, you would want to prevent the uh, blind elephant from knowing or identifying what versions you have. And then the third tool is called Plecost. Uh, it identifies web applications based on the readme files. So for instance, it will try to find what version of web WordPress you're running based on uh, the contents of the readme file. Um, every application and version or new version of WordPress WordPress, which is released, has its uh, has to have a README with it. So it's a piece of identifying information which you can find out what this application is. Um, but currently, best practices dictate that when you deploy an application, um, you should not include the README. So you shouldn't be able to access the README. So it makes the tool sort of uh, not accurate enough. So. Um, I want to talk about a tool that I've been working on for the past half a year. It's called Kitsune, which is um, a Japanese mythical creature known for its intelligence, which is usually depicted by a fox. So we wanted to create this application in a smart way and try to identify as accurately as possible from a purely defensive standpoint what applications uh, are on your system. And not only can it identify what application you are running, but it can also identify any libraries which your application uses. So in the current state, Kitsune currently uh, supports or matches against 627 unique versions across 11 different web applications. And we're constantly adding more and more as it grows. It, so a little bit about how it works. It's split up into a three-stage process. The first is it performs a file system scan. And you can specify a path from where you want to start scanning. And it collects all the files into what we call an artifact. And in the same stage two, we take the artifact, the collection of files, and we try it and we fingerprint it. So we say, uh, which application do these files match? And then the third stage is we put, put it into the probabilistic model. So we can't accurate 100% say what application it is or what version it is. But we can say it has an 80% probability that it is you know, WordPress, or it has a 70% probability that it's Joomla. And we can control the um, threshold. We can say, only show us results which are 90% or more, or however uh, much you want. So it's a completely open source application. Um, it's written in Ruby, and it's using a SQLite database, which you can change um, to any SQL-like database that you want. And when we were designing the application, we wanted uh, it to be as configurable as possible. So you're not limited to our database, but you can create your own database to use. So if you have a application that you use internally, uh, you can create the file, uh, the fingerprints and the checksums and uh, store it into the database. You can also import a database uh, or download a database from someone else and use that in your system. And we use a hashing algorithm called XXHash, which is a non-cryptographic hash function uh, built purely for speed. So we decided that we didn't really need a cryptographic hash function. We just needed some sort of fingerprint. and um, XXHash is really, really fast, so it greatly improved our uh, performance. 
So in the current state, um, these are some of the command line options that you have. So you can, uh, so it requires two options. First, a path where you want to start scanning from. And the second is a, uh, the database file that you want to use. Um, so you can specify what format you want to output the results in. So uh, the default is just some sort of uh, text output. But you can say, I want it in JSON format, or I want it in YAML format, or CSV. Um, you can also create your own custom formats if you wanted to. And the reason we did this is because we wanted uh, you to be able to, uh, we didn't want you to be limited to one output, but we wanted you to uh, see the results in a way that you best uh, would use them the best. And you can, as I said earlier, you can specify the threshold. So you can say, filter for results which are greater than this or uh, less than this. And you can also filter for a certain web application or a certain version. So um, now I'd like to give you a quick demo. Hopefully it works. Can everyone see that? Better? Yeah. All right. So I'll just um, do a quick example. To So um, I'm specifying a directory where I want to start the scan from, which is I have a application in my downloads folder, um, which I, I'll talk about in a bit. And uh, the database which I use is just a SQLite database, which has the uh, 11 different versions or 11 different applications in it. So it's taking a little bit to uh, scan. There are a bunch of files in there. So it shouldn't take too long, though. Can you all see that? All right. um, so as we can see, the application, I, I, had to, I had to rename it because I was actually testing it on a uh, application which was, um, which you could, which is in deployment right now. Um, I didn't want to reveal what the application actually was yet. Um, <laughs> um, but it was built, I can tell you it's built upon WordPress. And uh, you can see that it, it uses three different versions of uh, WordPress 3.9 uh, about. But we can filter these results even more if we wanted to. And uh, I'll make it a bit easier to read as well. And I forgot to filter it, sorry. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, because in the results that you see here, uh, none of them were 90% uh, or more. They were around 89. So we should get no results here, I think. Yep. And then if we can say anything which matches 50% uh, or more, we should get a lot more results. So, uh, so it didn't match anything else. So in this case, you can see that the web application uh, was built upon WordPress 3.9 with an accuracy of about 80%. 
right? Um, so, as I said again, the uh, application is completely open source. So, um, feel free to contribute if you want. Um, there's my information. Are there any questions? Yes. Yes. Any, yes. Um, currently, uh, so our, the question was if we can um, use this fingerprinting mechanism to scan uh, not applications but devices themselves, and um, I don't think so currently because it literally just takes a uh, checksum of the file, actual binary data on the file system. Um, I don't know of how you would be able to do I, I like actually identify the device that way, so. Um, so currently it is web applications, but if you can take any application which you have the or you have the source code to, um, and add it to the database, and it would still be able to identify the applications. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, you currently have to manually add it, but uh, we can add that. Yeah. Not yet, no. Yes. Um, I think if it was to be used in production, it would have to be rewritten first. Um, but currently, it started out as just a project to work on, but you could use it in production um, with a bit of work, yes. Yes. Thank you, Julie, for the presentation. Uh, what's unique about this tool? Because there are other tools there in the market that can show the purpose of fingerprinting. Um, so, uh, so the question was, there are other tools which do application fingerprinting, so what makes this tool different than others? Um, the first is, from what I've seen, most of the open source uh, web application fingerprinting tools that are out there uh, are from a purely offensive standpoint. So they're not defending, they're just attacking, trying to uh, identify the web applications in some sort of... Um, black hat manner, right? Um, either by identifying network traffic or uh, trying to find files in a certain location on the web server and fingerprint it that way. Uh, this tool is built purely from a defensive standpoint. So you are supposed to run it on a machine which you have complete access to and you would fingerprint the files. So it's not so much uh, trying to identify a version for attacking, but trying to identify the version so you know what you can defend. Uh, or if there is a vulnerability for that version, you know what to, uh, to fix. Yes? Um, does the support any no, it doesn't. Uh, the question was, does the application support any APIs? And uh, no, it does not. It's written in Ruby. It's open source, so um, 